Hi everyone, my name is Geeta. I'm the creative producer of The Capital at RMIT. Thanks for joining us here today for our second in conversation with Prototypes Care Package artists. If you didn't join us last week, just a little rundown. Care Package is a weekly newsletter delivering new, remixed, re-edited and underseen works made by artists in lockdown and they're sent straight to your inbox. This week we have prototype curator Lauren Carroll Harris joining us again and Tian Baker whose work was screening across Prototypes Care Package this week and we'll get to more about her work called Tarun in a minute. Before we go any further I wanted to do an acknowledgement of the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we meet today. I respectfully acknowledge they are ancestors and elders, past and present. So as I said, this week we welcome Tian Baker, who's originally from Darwin and now living in Sydney. And she'll be talking about her work, Tarun, which is a beautiful document of her attempt to inhabit and connect to her maternal lineage. Um, a little background on Tian, who is a Malaysian Bidayu Anglo-Australian video, video and installation artist. Baker's practice engages with sites where contemporary crises around neoliberalism, neocolonialism, environmental degradation and psycho-spiritual alienation are staged. She uses field research and documentary techniques to explore our emotional experience within wider socio-political contexts. Um, and our host, who joined us last week and is back this week, is Lauren Carroll Harris, a writer and curator and co-founder of Prototype, an experimental video production unit and culturally progressive screen streaming platform, which initiated this year's Care Package project. Lauren, we did go through Care Package last week, but just briefly for any new um, audience members we have this week, can you just give us a little bit of a brief rundown of what Prototype is and what Care Package is specifically? Yeah, sure. Prototype uh, came onto the scene last year um, as a way to ex uh, support, commission, advocate for, exhibit um, really cool, experimental, interesting artists who are working between video art and cinema. And then this year in March, I was stuck at home in quarantine, frustrated, depressorama, and I called up a bunch of different artists like Tian and said, could you make something pretty fast so that we can, you know, find ways to make art together even though we're apart? And this is kind of, this is it. This is the last week of the Prototype Care Package. So I was really, really happy and proud to um, be putting out Tian's work this week. Is this number 11 in this series? Yeah. 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 It's it's a it's actually like a big deal, you know. It's a significant body of work that we're putting out every year. So it's it's cool to be part of something new, even though the world's imploding a little bit. Yeah, it's such a it was such a brilliant response, and the fact that you were able to do it so quickly and use all the tools that you know the last remaining tools that we're able to use during lockdown is um. Yeah, I mean, hats off to you, Lauren. Um, and for people at home who haven't been subscribing to the series all the way through, after this week, I believe Prototype will be putting all of the works back up on the website so you can go and look at all of them. And also, so you know, in on our Capital website where you're watching, where you linked to this conversation just now, we do have links to Tian's work. So if you haven't yet watched it, you can watch after this conversation. Um, before I hand over to Lauren and Tian to get um, started in the conversation, I thought we'd watch a little clip um, from Tian's uh, work, Tarun. Do you want to introduce that clip, Tian, and then we'll throw to you guys after we've watched that? Um, yeah, it's just a little clip from the work of um, when I went out to go and collect durian with my family and just shot that space. And I think... I don't remember exactly what's in there, but I think I know at the end it's like a really embarrassing shot of me like trying to open durian and my cousin being like, get get away from me. <laughs> Not quite, but that's what it was actually like. It doesn't look like that on screen, but that's actually what it was like. But yeah, anyway. Back 
makin aku tubuh, aku selalu payah mikir bangsa ada. Anak-anak ini ada bau, tapi kai puan pasal ada bangsa atau pandai ngonak kayu. Tentu napa lah mama tubuh dan binutnya menjual atau napa aku nak rasa menampuku menampak hari dengan ramin. Anak ini apa uti semua ada kerja memit gaji masuk perintah atau company. Anya pinaira berumah atau bicabon. Anak aku pun kaya nepoan gaya mengsiens sebab nyeranak di Australia. Lauren, do you want to start while we get Tian unmuted just with your comments on why you chose Tian's work and how the process of, um, you know, how the process of curating with her started? Well, I knew Tian was in Malaysian Borneo for the first three months of the year on the Friedman Foundation Travelling Scholarship and we were communicating the whole time, sending each other, you know, artworks to look at and stuff like that and then Tian had to be in quarantine for two weeks as soon as she got back and I had a feeling there'd be a work in in what she'd discovered um, in this kind of journey into heritage and I, I had a feeling from our discussions that um, and maybe you'll contradict me Tian I don't know but um that she didn't want to just do something that was confirming cultural identity, but that was diving into the nuances and complexities of how to how to live across cultures today, how to be a person um, in a world that is kind of hostile to your existence. And um, I love what's come out of this. I, I find it a really beautiful, moving, affecting work that doesn't shy away from the hard, hard, complex issues around language preservation and, um, and you know, what happens hundreds of years after colonialism, basically. That, that's one of the key issues it raises for me. And I, I'm enjoying your Sarawak Borneo T-shirt, Tian. And I know that <laughs> I know this wasn't your first trip to the area. Do you want to take us back to the beginning? Yeah. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah you're, you're right. I didn't want to reaffirm like cultural identity I wanted to explore some complex emotions around it but um I had been there before and that's how I sort of knew that I was going to take that approach because like when I told my family that I wanted to go to the village for a few months they were literally like why <laughs> they were like you better have something to do it's it's really hard like I'd been there We'd, I'd been lucky enough to maybe go every four or five years and hang out with my family for like whatever family event we had but like not being able to speak being in like a you know a totally different environment a totally different culture and then there being like a sort of an expectation of us being able to relate is really hard um so no yeah it wasn't my first time there and I knew it was going to be hard and I spent a long time preparing for that um, I pretty much spent like the year leading up learning Padayu with my mum so I wouldn't have, I could have, I at least had like something to start with um, and just yeah, yeah I'd been there before, I knew it was going to be a tough trip. Yes. And your new, and this work, it's it's not ironic like your old works, it's very personal, it, it, it doesn't share that digital aesthetic but I feel that it does centre on a crisis of Western malaise. I guess that's that's a bit of a theme for you, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, or like a crisis, like a general bigger overarching crisis and how people are experiencing that in un unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. um, definitely this was like, there's like the legacy of Western malaise, but it is a culture, it is a crisis of like collision between indigeneity and capitalism. Tian, I was thinking that we in Australia don't have a great cultural narrative about Indigenous people being in Southeast Asia. I, I feel like most Australians haven't even heard of Badaya people. But I understand 
the trip really challenged your own ideas about indigeneity as well? Um, yeah, so I guess that became like a really big driver for me being on my trip there is that I was really determined to um, meet my family on their own terms and in their own terms of indigeneity and like not bring my understandings that come from my Australian context um, into that into that conversation and like put expectations on them that that aren't fair um, and that was like at times was a source of like a lot of genuine anxiety for me um, not wanting to be like this like white girl outsider you know putting pointing fingers or like um, so yeah, so yeah, I, I was really determined to understand my family on their own terms and their own like understand their own ideas of indigeneity and not bring my own ideas to the table. What frictions emerged? What kind of cultural differences did you encounter? Definitely they love the church there. Like the church is like a really big deal. And the fact that I I, I said in the video, but truly the fact that I like don't identify as having religion was like a, a ongoing source of tension for my time there because I avoided going to church constantly um, and they love the church and like obviously having read what I've read about like colonial English colonial history in the region um, you know the church was like a, a big perpetrator of like colonialism they were some of the first people on the ground um, and they were like a real driver in like bringing the English government in to extract resources from the land. They were a big driver in, um, you know, suppressing cultural practices that like they found to be unsavory. Uh, and, and, you know, fast forward however many hundreds of years, like my family are really invested in their various churches. Um, and I had to do a lot of work to, I, I couldn't, there's no way I could explain that I, didn't have religion and why but I had to do I, I had to I had to really be like well you love your church like even though in my eyes it is like an agent of dispossession of culture I'm gonna try and see it on your terms you love the church it's important to your community um that was one another one that was just an another ongoing like just drain was yeah just environmental um ideas about environmental conservation were I uh, just to my to my eyes non-existent there <laughs> right because you and I grew up in Australia in the 90s when like recycling was cool and CFCs were being eliminated and you know I don't know did I, I went and did all those you know those picking up litter days yeah <laughs> but I yeah. guess environmentalism yeah. is a western phenomena right exactly environmental like I just had to realize that to my knowledge there has been no, there hasn't been an environmental movement in Malaysia. So why would, you know, why, like, why would anyone think about that if that's not a cultural part of the culture? But also, like, in another way, it had to be like, well, you know, like, uh, indigenous people in the region, when they threw things out, they did just throw them into the river because the things that they were using were like made of leaves and like right. banana leaves and bark and stuff. So now that like they have plastic and like harsh chemicals and cleaning chemicals they're also going to go in the river because do, do you know what I mean like yeah I mean there was no garbage before colonialism right? exactly, exactly. <laughs> garbage is so confronting like garbage there's no sewage system I I've talked I like I'm obsessed I'm obsessed with this there's no sewage system in the village so like anything that goes into the pipes, like goes into the freshwater system. So like you can just imagine when you have access to like gumption, like any, like the most crazy stripping cleaners, micro, like you got access to everything and you're just putting that straight into the water. Um, that's pretty crazy. And also like animal, I saw a lot of endangered and like elite, Ill, like animals being like illegally kept in, in homes and a lot of illegal hunting. And again, you know, um, the jungle belongs to, this land belongs to my family and like they've always hunted in that way. And does that make it okay to like, I don't know, it, it was really confronting. That was like 
a constant source of like anxiety and distress for me that these ideas this is real I ask for kids stuff isn't it being constantly challenged that you have grown up in a western environment and yet you're trying to connect to to heritage I mean I know that the area you're talking about was first colonized by the British and now it's under Malaysian rule let's talk about you know identity how does your how does your family identify do they identify as Malaysian I can't really to be honest I can't speak that much for my family in Malaysia I think they do I think they do but like as the Malaysian, sorry what did you say that's interesting in and of itself isn't it yeah yeah well because they're you know they're living there and they're working in a in the operating and functioning and living within like the Malay ethno state so I guess to not identify as Malaysian. I don't know, I'm not really sure. I can't speak for that. My mum like vehemently doesn't identify as Malaysian. And so therefore I guess like none of us, none of me or none of my siblings do. But like, we don't eat the same food. We don't speak the same language. You know, we don't even have the same religion. Like why would I identify right. as Malaysian? Do you know what I mean? Like, Why would you identify with the colonizer? The colonizer. Yeah. I mean, the presence of ghosts is very strong in your work as well. I mean, even before you have this encounter with a ghost, the whole work feels haunted. And then this metaphor of hauntedness materialises and there's literally, you know, a story that emerges with a ghost. Tell me about that hauntedness that's running through the work. Firstly, I want to know what you what for you is the story of the emerging ghost in the work. I was worried that was like too weird and like disparate and there were many ghosts and like No, I I didn't read it as being about whether ghosts are real, you know. I, I didn't interpret it like that. I I felt that there was a strong sense that maybe ghosts and hauntedness are a part of culture and and stories and and families being in the land there but that was just my interpretation yeah I would say that's like 100% correct is like ghosts are like just part of daily conversation they're like truly embedded in like you like punish your kids by saying like if you're being naughty I'll leave you at home and the ghosts will get you like (laughs) (laughs) Like, that's like normal like any People, I used to get told that, like, back here in Australia. Anyway, um, so, yeah, ghosts are really, like, accepted part of daily conversation. People don't really, there's not this question of, like, do you believe or not? I'm not saying, like, everyone does there, but, like, you know, they're part, of, they are part of culture. And on top of that, um, I have seen ghosts in the village. That, that's, that experience has stayed with me as a kid. And, you know, just, like, shaman is and black magic and those things that we would call here like supernatural or whatever are just part of normal life um so that felt very natural to me to bring that into the conversation but also there's the obvious idea that like um like the idea a diasporic existence is a haunting in itself is a sort of experience of being haunted by an entity that you can never really understand but it's just like an ever-present part of your life and it like disturbs you you know yeah there's this strong sense of migration being traumatic and I found it really sad to to hear your mother's story I mean there's two stories really it's your journey to Sarawak and your mother's story bound by this one place but you sense that a lot of the things that her family feared kind of came true (laughs) yeah I don't know maybe you know quite a lot about my family but I often like before going there I sometimes thought like man maybe my mom shouldn't have migrated like maybe she should have maybe she would have had a better life if she stayed and definitely being there I don't want to I don't want to speak for her she's her own person she made her own decisions um, and she's built her own life. But, like, definitely being there, I was like, like, why would you? I don't know. I mean, I can't speak, you know, that's 30, 40 years ago. But I was like, 
you know, I don't know. I don't know if if migrating in her instance necessarily led to a better life, to be honest. You know, who who wants to be away from family? Like we were talking about the other day. I was like, Mum, how do you feel about the fact that, you know, like you're going your siblings are gonna start dying and you're not gonna be there for it? You know, how do you how do you feel about that? And she was like, Well, I just have to accept that, you know, and I was like, this place when I was hanging out there, I was like, You've got family, it's it is a middle income country, it doesn't have quite the 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 benefits that we have but like it's it's not the worst um and it was just like very peaceful and happy some of the times like it doesn't come out in the video but like it was very beautiful it was really nice to be around families a really nice community um everyone was really caring so yeah yeah it's such a lush verdant green video I think the beauty of the place really comes through and I've been looking at the data in the prototype Google and it Google Analytics account and I've noticed an increase in viewers in Malaysia what do your family I mean they're your family <laughs> I, know, I know they must be what do they make of this work I love that as well that we can put this online and everyone can engage with it that way yeah that definitely was like one of the main reasons I wanted it to be an online work obviously because the conversations that you get to have with your family who you made the work about are really crucial and you can take that going forward but um yeah to be honest I was really scared about releasing the work I was really worried that I would upset someone in a way that I like didn't quite understand or couldn't quite predict um or that I yeah I was worried I'd done something bad and I still haven't like fully sent it to everyone but the family who I have sent it to um are like no, why would you be angry? One of my cousins said, why would why would we be angry? Everything you said is true, wow. which was quite nice to, to get a sort of validation that I didn't perceive things in a way that was like super Western colonizer, like psycho mind, but like I actually handled the, the, the ideas correctly by their standards, which was really important to me. Um, yeah, my mum finally watched it. I was terrified of her watching it, but oh, really? it, 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 no one's been mad. Everyone's been like, yeah, that these are true things that you've said and it's good. <laughs> I'm glad. Really put yourself out there and you handle all this stuff really sensitively. Like, I mean, your art practice is so online now as well. I mean, it was kind of going in that direction even before galleries were cancelled by COVID. How do you feel about making video work for online compared to the traditional gallery space? Uh, I really like it. In fact, I don't, this like may get me in hot water, but like why would I make a single screen work for a gallery? It doesn't I work very often. I don't quite often. understand why I would do that. Like, Not in that I'm, context. No, not like sure, like obviously multi-screen work, which is awesome and cool, but like if I was going to make a single screen work that, where like tells a story and you want to watch it from this the start to the end why would I make it for a gallery like obviously I would want to make it for online because people can watch it in their own time also like I I found that like all the work that I've made for online has sort of had like the most impacts for my for my work as a as an artist their own life they've had yeah they've gone on and like had this like really weird life and like ended up in like other countries and like people email me and they're like Tyler Durden or whatever they email me like saying weird stuff so um and that's really fun and I, I don't know if would I at my like stage in my career I don't know if I would get that from a gallery yeah definitely, I, definitely single screen video making is like I still haven't seen a good reason why not to make it solely for online distribution do you know what I mean Oh, 100%. I often feel that video works in galleries can be quite, I don't know, static and oppressive and alienating if they're just lodged on a screen. And I feel there's an intimacy to kind of looking at it like this. And and I guess I know as well that your next work continues the Durian themes. I really want to talk about this because it's a bit of a hot issue in food writing at the moment, this kind of question of how Western food writing has othered, exoticized, freaked out about 
anything that's like mildly not like Anglo, anything that's a bit different. And you get the sense in your work, Tarun, that there's this really central place, uh, durian farming and durian eating to the food culture there. And, and I understand there's a whole section of the Badai language devoted to it too. Where, where are you taking this next? Um, yeah, definitely developing work about durian. I When I first, when I was there, I, w- I went for durian season. So like truly I was never more than five meters away from a durian at all times. Like it was just constant. Like the durian hustle was constant. You would not believe every morning, every night, people were going up and down the mountain like with these big bags of durian bringing them in opening was like just it was just constant um and I like when I I was so you're like this is actually something I can eat (laughs) um and then when I was there and I yeah it was just around so much durian I just felt so impotent a lot of the time like I just felt really deficient um I had this idea of like wow imagine if my imagine if I opened a durian and it was empty, it just had no meat in it. And what if every durian I opened was empty and my family were just like, why, like, what's wrong with you? Like, it just, that just sort of became like, that was just something I thought about a lot. And then when I came back, I was like, I think I, I think I want to make work about durian. Like, it is a hot topic. I was worried that it would be naff to start going in that direction. But like, I can't believe how much everyone has an opinion, like whether you've, whether you've eaten one or not, like everyone just knows like two things about it. Doesn't matter, like you know what I mean. So yeah, I so really like great symbol of Western hysteria. Yeah, I that's how I like thinking about it. But I also like thinking about it as a launching pad for like multiple conversations to collide. So it's an object that the West is just is hysterical over, and it's an object that like Southeast Asian cultures are to some extent but there's a deeper connection so you can kind of have it's like a a point where two conversations can happen and collide and intermix so I'm definitely developing work at the moment around durian and like drawing on its like menacing frightening smell and it's like menacing look and um trying to mix that in with what I observe to be the importance of durian to to my mum's culture yeah. Dion, when yeah. you said you felt deficient when you were, you said you were like felt impotent and deficient. Do you mean like culturally deficient? Like, yeah, what, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that, like, I couldn't, you know, like when I'm there, my family are like, oh, this like white girl, like, what do you, <laughs> do you know oh, what I mean? Like, that's, like, oh, that's all. But it's like it's hard, like you know, and and it's not like I'm part of say the Chinese Australian community that looks from the outside to be really well established and like you can still celebrate your culture or like have connection to it in Australia and be like a Chinese Australian but that just doesn't exist for Badaya people in Australia like truly I haven't I haven't met any other Badaya people other than my own family right so I have no my only connections to my mom she gives me like drip feeds me information um so you know when I go there I do just feel like a big dumb dumb <laughs> just like an idiot I hope it's changed through this work I hope you meet some Badai people through through yeah. releasing this online I really hope so as well yeah but um yeah it's definitely like sorry no no you you finish you go <laughs> yeah it's just definitely a journey of like trying to move beyond that um shame and find a way to like I don't know celebrate or like come to terms with or reckoning as as Lauren put it in the curatorial notes um definitely going there and making this work was a part of that and this new durian work is this all being done in, in lockdown now I can say oh no well I guess you're Sydney so you're slightly less locked down but is this something you're is it like beginning stages like how far through it through it are you and how are you finding the process of making another thing in a relatively locked down state? Um, Yeah, so I'm a finalist in the New South Wales Visual Arts Emerging Award and um, which is really cool. I'm super grateful. Actually, 
believe it, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know, the the thing that I'm um, trying to engage, like the thing that I want to do the scholarship for is to start doing more long-term sort of research-based investigations into this these questions that Tarun brought up. Um, so I thought, you know, why not? Like, let's make a new work and let's make it about Durian. Like, it's a really good starting point. It's a really, it's really good to have initial investigations. Like, it as a material itself is already so evocative that you can just do, you don't have to do too much and it already can already go somewhere. So yes, I am making at the moment. Um, do not love making work in this period. Um, <laughs> somehow weirdly super busy um juggling it with like lots of other projects at the moment that all have very tight deadlines so <laughs> so i'm actually finding it really stressful actually i'm really finding this this period of making during lockdown really stressful and i don't know why i don't know how it is for anyone else i don't know if it's because like i'm digital or like i have been a digital artist in the past and maybe that just opened up opportunities for me during this time i'm not really sure but it's mm. pretty crazy right now <laughs> I think I'd just like to say that I'm sorry, Tian, we live in a white supremacist society <laughs> and I think you've done a beautiful job, you know, working through these feelings of shame and dislocation and, you know, your practice is taking off. Like it's also a shame that Australia hasn't developed the digital cultural infrastructure until now. But I think that, you know, you are on a precipice of just like really occupying a bigger part of this cultural space that really needs to be taken up. You know, the people who are going to make the kind of world and art and film world that I would like to live in are not white middle class guys, you know. And I hope that this space can be like cool and healing and, and useful for you to explore these ideas of um heritage and um community thank you it's very kind nice words Thanks. and i just yeah i would just say i concur it was such a beautiful and sensitive work and really accessible so for someone who doesn't know anything about your culture it was immediately accessible and um relatable I mean I have a completely different culture but yeah it's um yeah I really made it to be like that because I like I often <laughs> I haven't like I don't make work I haven't made work about my mum's culture um and I like often don't tell people about because people don't know what I'm talking about like people are like what do you wear where's Borneo like even just very basic facts Where's Borneo? Our neighbours. This is the Asia Pacific, you know. Australia is allegedly part of this region. Yeah. Let's be or there. Like, Let's learn. Borneo is split in half by two countries that occupy it. Like, just very basic facts just aren't there. Um, so I really made it to that most people, you know, that's why there's, like, these weird moments of, like, they look like from a dictionary um where they like give definitions yeah. that's also because I was hanging out in dictionaries a lot for like two months so that's yeah. like the visual thing for me but um well, yeah. Yeah. thanks for being so responsive and collaborative and thanks Geeta for hosting this. thanks to prototype subscribers who've been with us since the beginning and probably saw Tian's first work for prototype last year as well yeah, thanks, guys. Um, much to Victorians. <laughs> and um, next week we'll be going a little bit backwards in time and showing Sam, um, well, not showing, we'll be introduced, welcoming Sam Smith from London into the conversation and we'll make his work available to watch um, from our website as well. But for tonight, thank you so much. And... That's it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. See ya. Bye.